Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live. This evening, we have a prophetic segment of our broadcast. Uh, we'll be looking at some news that's a little bit older, as well as uh, some current news. And from the different things that I'm taking a look at right now, it's really what has uh, brought me to this message tonight. Where are we in God's prophetic time? Uh, that's a tough thing to actually try to answer, but uh, the things that I'm seeing going on right now is very alarming, and I needed to come and share with you because I am watching an ecumenical movement that is just taking the world by storm, and I am afraid that many people are going to get caught up in this whirlwind of deception and end up believing a lie. And I certainly don't want to see that. Too many of you guys are our friends and, and we love you guys tremendously and we want to make sure that people know what truth really is only by His grace as He reveals it. Let's take a look at some of the things that we're seeing here. Uh, this video here came as a result of other things that I was seeing of, of ecumenical movements that are going on in Israel. And a lot of people thinking the ecumenical movement is a good thing. And it seems outwardly that it might be a good thing. When you see both Jews and Christians coming together, praying together, uh, that would seem to be a good thing. And of course... Uh, uh, other, other type things of this nature. But there's a very serious fine line in there that God is not going to accept. And I think this is what we have to take a look at and see exactly what's going on. Uh, why do a priest, a rabbi, and of course it's a video here you're about to see, so let me just show you. It's like 38 seconds long. I want you to watch what happens here. It's very concerning. Let's look, take, a, take a look at this uh, and what happens in the video. Why do a priest, a rabbi, and an imam meet up? Of course, they're all three together. The priest, the rabbi, and the imam. They are crazy enough for an outrageous idea. Yep, they're building a house together for Jews, Christians, and Muslims. As you can see it on the thing, kind of very similar to a third temple. Help them build, donate now, says the thing. The house of one. Three religions, one house, www.houseofone.org. You, you saw it right. I mean, it is, let me, let me bring you to, um, if I can actually, I don't know if I can fast forward this or not. Um, let me see if I can pause it then, at least when it gets to this thing called the house of one. Uh, we might be able to, to pause it right there. I don't know. Let's just see here. The imam, by the way, was in the middle, the Jew was on the left, and the Christian was on the right, and that last, there it is right there. It has a certain look of the third temple, only a certain look, a little flare to it from the side view there. So I thought it was interesting. This is going on in Berlin, Germany. They're going to build this house of one. Now, this is only a small scale of what's coming in Israel, friends. They're going to, they're trying to fake a millennial reign. And believe me, there's so many scriptures I could have brought out in this. Uh, think of Daniel as well, how it speaks about in Daniel, how that uh, they, they come together, uh, they're working together with this, this, this evil system. Uh, they try to marry the vision, as Daniel puts it. Now, if you try to put that in a search term, it's not going to come up. That's just the literal translation. They're trying to marry the vision, but they're going to fail in what they're doing there. Let me take you, let's get right into the heart of this. The third temple for all uh, humankind of Temple Mount of Jerusalem. See, the third temple for all humankind on the Temple Mount of Jerusalem. See, there is a great movement for a one world religion, and they're going to make Jerusalem the headquarters, okay? Now, watch what it says. This is on the templemount.org. This is by Moses V. Kamaski, who's the architect of this. It says they need to integrate economic, political, and cultural life of nations manifest itself clearer than ever in the modern world. This process is realized in two major directions, under pressure through power of one over another and by free will, as a brotherhood of people devoted to their common father creator. Doesn't that sound like some of the things that Pope Francis has said recently? Exactly. He says that we are all one. 
We all serve the same God. But you know, it doesn't seem to line up with the Word of God in that regards there. But let's continue on uh, with uh, Mr. Kams uh, uh, Kamaski's uh, uh, article here. He goes on to state just a very brief part of the article. It's very long if you want to go read that. It's his website, templemount.org. It's entitled, The Third Temple for All Humankind on the Temple Mount of Jerusalem. He goes on to say, The first direction is a blind alley that leads to succession of, a new, world, of, of new world conflicts. The second one is hardly achievable. However, in the period after the Second World War, decisive changes in ecumenical direction have taken place concerning the Christian world, i.e., a mutual approach of Catholicism, Protestantism, and partly Orthodox Church. Lifting of anthemus, creation of a world council of churches, the experience of a particular many days common prayers, arrangement of extra confessional communities, uh, analogous uh, to communities of the first Christians. He goes on, certain success of the ecumenical movement has strengthened the basis for the creation of the common European market as the first step to national union on the grounds of the free will. In the half of the century, goodwill dialogue of Christianity and Judaism has for the first time been possible. The whole rehabilitation of Judaism as a worldwide religion, acknowledgement of the legality and equality of the two testaments. That's a Jew writing it. The, 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 the equality of the two testaments. Okay, Acknowledgement of Jesus as a great prophet by Israelites and acknowledgement by some Christian theologians that Jesus was created by the Heavenly Father. Okay? So he's using this great ecumenical movement that the Catholic Church has pu pushed for, which they did it in the, in the Nostra Aetate, and also bringing on the Jews to sign in on it, that this is, this is unifying the world. Now there's a great, huge movement of this ecumenical movement going on in the background, and it's as demonic as it comes. I know it looks like a great thing on the outside, guys, but it's not a great thing. Now, remember what God commanded Moses, all right? Exodus 23, 32, Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in thy land, lest they make thee sin against me. For if thou serve their gods, it will surely be a snare unto thee. Now, some of you guys might say, wait a minute, Brother Steve, wait a minute now. We're talking about Christians that serve the same God that the Jews serve. Don't forget, though, the Pope's bringing in the Imam with all this. He's bringing in the Muslims that, that, that serve the God of Allah. And friends, that's not the same God as the God of Israel. It's not the same God that the, 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 the true believers of Yeshua serve. And I kind of question, even in the Vatican itself, if it's what if, if they're not serving some other god as well because they serve the gods of idols, idolatry. They may claim to honor God with their lips, but their heart is far from him, as the prophet said about Israel at one time. All right, let's take a look now. Again, another very concerning article on Breaking Israel News, May 15, 2016. This came out. Watch, Miracle of Modern Israel Brings Jews and Christians Together in Prophetic Gathering. Now, I'm not against Jews and Christians coming together. I'm not against that, all right? Let me just make that clear. I'm not against that. I, it's a great thing, like I said, to see the Jewish people and the Christian people sit down together and talk about the Word of God to try to bring about a mutual understanding. But you have to understand too though, God is dealing with Israel as a nation. And, you're, and, and all that's going on right now is, does not mean that, that rabbis and, and Jews of Israel are believing that Yeshua is the Messiah and that they're going to embrace Him as Messiah. That's not what this is about. 
but it's bringing together a one world religion. This is what this is really about, friends. And although it appears to be good on the outside, it's as wicked as it can get on the inside because the real ultimate aim is something that is written in the Bible prophetically that's going to come to pass, friends, and it's on the verge of actually fulfilling already right before your eyes and we don't even realize it's there. All right, watch what this happens here. When the people of Israel sang the special halal, which halal in Hebrew means praise, uh, prayer service last Thursday to praise God for the creation of the state of Israel, new voices joined the chorus, the Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation, that's the CJCUC, brought 120 representatives of two religions together for a day to praise in honor of Israel's independence. Independence Day, Yom HaAtzimat, in the Gush Etzion. The recitation of Psalms was done in a very special way in order to fulfill a, special, a specific biblical prophecy. Now the prophecy they claim, the executive director of the CCJUC explained to Breaking Israel News fulfills the prophecy of Zephaniah. Now I'll quote the prophecy. I totally disagree with them, but I'll quote it. For then I will turn to the peoples of pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. All right. So they believe that if all these different churches are here now singing the Psalms of David in the Hebrew language, that this is that pure language being restored unto the people. That's not Zephaniah's prophecy, friends. He's restoring the pure language so you know how to say God's divine name. All right, now let's take a look at this so you just see what I'm talking about. Let's, now I'm only going to read to you the two, two verses, but you can go back and read all of Zephaniah. This is a major thing that happens in Israel. Therefore, wait you upon me, saith the Lord. Wait upon him. He's the one that's involved in the restoring of this pure language. All right, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations that I might assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, this guy here is saying this is being fulfilled because they're all gathering, the nations are gathering together, the different peoples are coming there in order to sing psalms in the name, and this is the fulfilling of Zephaniah. Not according to the prophet of Zephaniah, not according to God, what God told Zephaniah. Zephaniah said, yes, I'm going to gather these nations. Yeah, they're going to be gathered. They're going to come to Israel, but they're coming to Israel for God's indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then will I turn the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. When does he return that pure language to the people? He returns it when he's gathered the nations down to Israel when God is ready to pour out his fury upon them. Over what? The fire of my jealousy. Wow, what do you know? So the gathering of the nations, what, what do they do? They just throw the Bible out? Is that what it is? Well, you know, we don't need that part. Throw that one out. Oh, friends, come on, let's wake up now. Let's take, a, let's take a serious look then at what's going on then. You know, this is where your two witnesses come in. This is, when, this is when the two witnesses come in. That's God's bringing out his indignation through their ministry. Let's look and see. I'm going to show you, share with you something else. Exodus 34, verse 5 through 15. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Where? with Moses. See? So there's got to be a restoring of a pure language that they may call upon the name of the Lord. That's why there's got to be a pure language. Moses heard that pure language and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. That should be yod heh vav -Hey written right there. Yahuwah, Yehovah, whatever you want to try to say. That's the problem. We don't know that pure name. So he's got to restore a pure language, not to sing a psalm of David in Hebrew. 
Anybody can learn Hebrew and do that. Which, by the way, I am going to be starting on my wife's channel. Those of you who want to know that I am going to be starting a, a Hebrew teaching series there to teach you guys that want to know the Hebrew language. I'll be doing that on her channel. Anyway, Exodus 34, 6, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. See? So really and truly, when's that language going to be restored? When Moses returns. Watch what you'll, you'll see, Exodus 34. This is, a, this is a prophecy here in Exodus that never got fulfilled. I'll show you, I'll prove it to you. Keeping mercy for thousands, giving iniqui uh, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin that, they, that, that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, into the third and fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. This reminds me of Daniel's prophecy, Daniel's uh, 70th week. This is when God is supposed to forgive our sins and our iniquities. See? To pardon our iniquity. It's got to come to pass, friends. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels. Now, actually, in Hebrew, the word should be wonders. They, they, they changed the translation to marvels because they said that, you know, Moses couldn't have done something greater. He parted the Red Sea. He did all the plagues. And here we are, clear over into Exodus 34, Many, many years after, uh, during the wilderness journey, and God is telling Moses he's going to do wonders. Watch what he says. Such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with you. God's not done with Moses, friend. He's going to send Moses back and he's going to do a terrible thing. Among, see, all and all the people among which you are, thou art, you know, or which you're, in other words, among the people where you are. This isn't the children of Israel back there. This is, that's why I put it in blue there. It's a different group of people. It's a different group of people he's going to be among. And they shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Terrible thing. That's because there's going to be plagues all over again, but it's going to be greater than what it was during the time of Egypt, friends. Okay, observe that thou which I command thee this day, behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, and the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. See? Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. Now, that's another thing. What do you mean? What do you mean? Why is God saying to Moses, take heed lest I'll make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whether you go, where you're going, in other words. Moses is going to do greater miracles than what he did when he was here on the earth, and now God tells him he's going to go to the land. He's talking about the promised land, but yet God had already told Moses before this was even said here, you're not going in, Moses, because you... You know, lift it up yourself and smote the rock when I told you to speak to the rock. Whoa, wait a minute. Something's going on here then. We're looking at a prophecy that's not been fulfilled as of yet. But notice, so God tells him, don't make no covenants with them. You see how the rabbis are doing today with the Vatican, with this ecumenical movement? They're making covenants with them. And God told Moses, don't you do it. They're going to try, when the two witnesses come, they're going to try to get them to make some kind of covenant of peace or unity here. See, why do you think say, Psalm 83 says they have, they have uh, oh gosh, what is that real quick? Let me pull that up. Psalm 83, where he says they have, oh, I know what it is. They have consulted against thy hidden ones. Sufanecha. In Hebrew, Sufanecha is hidden ones. They have consulted against thy hidden ones. See? 
consult. Why, why do they consult? Well, who, who are the ones that are hidden? It's not a rapture. Don't think it's a rapture, friends. They ain't got nothing to do with the rapture. I can tell you that right now. Because the only ones that are hidden that they got to be got to be consulting about are the two witnesses. That's Moses and Elijah because they're coming back. All right? And God clearly shows that Moses is the one. I know that there are some people who believe it's, it's Enoch and Elijah. Uh, that's fine. I don't agree with that. I don't see that in the Bible whatsoever. You know, I know there's people that have done Bible codes on it. Well, let me tell you something. God said in his word, plain and simple, if there's one among you who's a prophet or spiritual, I, the Lord, will make myself known to them in dreams and in visions. And if what they say comes to pass, then fear them, for I'm with them. Now, see, God didn't say nothing about it. I'll make myself known to them in codes. And I'm not against codes, friends. I'm, I'm not. Okay, let me just clarify that. I love the, the brothers that, that, that do codes, but I, I do believe there should be a proper place for Bible codes and not to use it as a prophetic tool. You know how many Bible codes that I have seen that people have sent me that have failed or I've seen them online, they have failed in prophesying things one after another after another, but yet the people keep right on making them and people keep right on following it and they lift it up as if it's a prophecy from God and yet they fail one after another after another and God said if there be a prophet and what he says doesn't come to pass do not hear him and why do you listen to it then now if if, if a brother or sister either one that does codes if they did it and they, and they put it in that perspective and say I'm not prophesying this is I don't say this you know I, I just I just do this to show you it's kind of interesting because you could come up with all kinds of ideas and it don't work out. So that tells you then that the codes are not bulletproof. That's just like, it's, it's really, friends, it's no different than, than a person claiming to be a prophet that prophesies and their prophecy fails just as bad. See? Or somebody that claims that they had a dream, they say the dream was of the Lord and they prophesy and I've seen that happen many times as well. It's no different. It's not to pick on one or the other. It's in both, both sides of it. They, they have dreams and visions and say that God has told them that the rapture is happening this time, this time, this year, whatever the case may be and it all fails. See, people need to be on their knees repenting and asking God to forgive them for what they're doing then. I don't say that the brother or the sister, or whatever, that may go through something like that, that that's a wicked person. I just simply say that when that happens, repent, say before the public, I'm sorry that, you know, if, especially if you're doing it publicly and say, you know, forgive me, brother, sister, I, I didn't mean to do that. See, just be honest with people. See, that's what people want is honesty. That's why, my friends, I don't sit here and try to prophesy nothing to you. You know, and, and yes, God has dealt with me in visions. I'm not talking about dreams, I'm talking about visions. And they have all come to pass. Everything that God's ever shown me in a vision has happened just the way he said it. But I don't go around making a, a, a trumpet about it because I'm nobody. I'm just your brother. You see, but this thing here, when we're looking at what God is doing right here with Moses and Elijah, see, they are coming back. Moses has got scriptures that he's never fulfilled. Do you know, according to, to uh, Exodus chapter 15, where he says, See, I will sing unto the Lord that he's gotten victory over the horse and over his rider, and he's hurled him into the sea. All right. Now, that's never been fulfilled, but yet Moses prophesied of one horse, one rider that's going to be thrown in the sea. I had a brother just sent me an email. Actually, I think his email was kind of old. I was trying to catch up on emails, and he mentioned to me, he said, Brother Steve, do you know that's also in Jeremiah chapter 51? I believe it's verse 21. And he's right. See? One horse and one rider. That's the Antichrist spirit in the last days it rises up. And Moses will be the one that will cast that rider and his horse into the sea. That's something. See, there were 600 when Moses was here the first time around. Had nothing to do with those there. All right? So, anyway... A lot of prophecies Moses hasn't fulfilled yet. Even the one where they ask him, or Moses says to God, they will ask me, my Shemo, what is his name? He says, what do I tell them? See? God said, Ihaye Asha Ihaye. See, I am that I am has sent you. Shalachani. But the problem is, they never asked him. 
And we don't, as far as biblical record, I can't find a biblical record where they ever asked him. But in this day, the children of Israel, when the two witnesses come, that two witnesses better know the divine name of Almighty God because they're going to ask him. That's what Zephaniah's prophecy is all about. God will restore a pure language where they might all call upon the name of the Lord. yod He vav He. That's the fulfillment of Zephaniah. Not some group of ecumenical movement there getting together in Israel, reading the psalm together. Nothing against that. Okay, I'm not against that part there. But I am against the Pope of Rome trying to bring together a one world religion, bringing the Muslims, the Christians, and the Jews together in a, in, in a one temple there I'm dead set against that you can count on it all right let's continue on verse 12 take heed to thyself lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whether thou goest lest there be a snare into the midst of thee but you shall destroy their altars break their images and cut down their groves do you know Moses ain't never done that and let me tell you something, that reminds me of Abraham in the book of Jubilees when I was reading that the other day. Remember when I come and told you guys? That's another thing that shows the scripture of Zephaniah. Remember what happened? What happened in the book of Jubilees? When, when, when Abraham, in the middle of the night, it recorded that he got up and he, and he burnt down the, the, the house of idols. Burn it to the ground. See? And when he burnt that thing down, then he began to cry out to God, wanting to know what the truth was. And what happened? The angel of the Lord come to Abraham and supernaturally gave him the Hebrew language. And according to the book of Jubilees, the Hebrew language was the original language of creation. And it had been blocked since the Tower of Babel, since the confusion of the dividing of the languages. And it had not been restored. And there were three books that he had. If I remember, I have three books. I think that's right. And they were written by Enoch and Noah. And God, not only did he have those books there, they were all written in the Hebrew language, but then God turned around and what did he do? He gave him also the divine revelation of what was written in the books. All in one night. You don't tell me Moses isn't coming back and going to restore a divine language for the people to restore that divine language so that they can call upon the name of the true name of yod heh vav -Hey? Wow. Brother, sister, it's going to be a marvelous time. You can count on that. Let me also share some more with you here. But you should, okay. For thou shalt worship no other God for the Lord whose name is jealous as a jealous God. Remember over here in Zephaniah? What did he say? He's coming. Verse 8, Even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Wow. For thou shalt worship no other God for the Lord whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. So, He's coming to fulfill that prophecy. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a-whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice. Let me tell you something, friends. We know already the Temple Institute has already started the sacrifices again. You don't think that the Vatican is not going to get involved in that as well, and be a part of it? Sure they are. In my heart, in my opinion, Yeshua was the ultimate sacrifice. We don't need another sacrifice. He gave His life. You see, the blood of bulls and goats, according to the book of Hebrews, will not take away sin. And not only that, their life can't come back upon you and come in you and give you the Holy Spirit. But what Christ did one time, once and for all, His life can come upon you and redeem you and put you one in fellowship with God once again. He is my sacrifice and I don't need another. Mm. Let's move on. Obadiah. This is a prophecy, friends. I've shared many times with you, but I never realized one particular part about this. Let me read to you. Verse 1, or chapter 1, verse 21. And Savior shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Now, the Lord, excuse me. 
the saviors or deliverers, as some translations uh, word this, are your two witnesses. They shall come up on Mount Zion. And by the way, that word there is ascend in the Hebrew language, ascend. They're not coming down from heaven. So they're already here on the earth somehow or another. I don't know how that's going to work, but they're here on the earth. So that tells me they will be in two human beings. All right. Their spirit anyway will be upon two people. All right, watch this. Shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. Friends, I, I really want to go slow with this to make sure you really get this. The saviors or deliverers are really, in this case here, it's the two witnesses. They come up on Mount Zion. But they come on Mount Zion to do what? To judge the Mount of Esau. Now, why are they on Mount Zion if they're going to judge the Mount of Esau unless Esau has taken over Mount Zion? And that slipped past me every time. I always knew that this was the two witnesses bringing judgment on the Vatican itself. But I never even caught that Obadiah was saying that Mount Zion is the Mount of Esau. In other words, Esau made Mount Zion his own. That is exactly what's happened. The exclusive, a seat for the Pope at King David's tomb. Guglio Miotti wrote this article February 1st of 2013. Israel seems to have sold Jerusalem to the Vatican, it states. An historic agreement has been drafted between Israel and the Vatican. The Israeli authorities have granted the Pope an official seat in the room where the Last Supper is believed to have taken place on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And where David and Solomon's Jewish kings of Judea are considered by some researchers also to be buried. Are you serious? Yes, I am. I mean, that's a Paul Begley right there. Are you serious? Yes. The Vatican has made Mount Zion the Mount of Esau. My gosh, friends. Another article, report, Vatican presses for control of Mount Zion. This is on February 20th, 2014, a year later. This was on Israel Today. Israel could be entering the final stages of negotiations to turn over control of Mount Zion to the Vatican. If recent reports by Israel National News are to be believed, according to the online source, a secretive meeting took place this week between the Jerusalem municipality, the prime minister's office, ministry of tourism, and senior Catholic officials. During the meeting, the Catholic delegation reportedly pressed Israel to follow through on a years-old proposal to give the church control over the compound that houses the traditional hall of the Last Supper, David's tomb, in other words. Okay, what does that do? That makes the Pope of Rome the king of Israel by giving him the official seat there. That makes him by sitting in the upper room and sitting there doing the communion with his delegation. And by the way, only men partook in that delegation. All right, now, let me just share something with you. I didn't put this on the screen. I got to tell you, though, because, guys, you got to know this. Obadiah says something very startling here. And I believe it's verse 16 is where it's at. Yes, it is. All right, now this is not a King James Version. I'm using a Jewish Bible because just as you drank on my holy mountain, okay, Kika Ashashutetem, Al Ha Kodeshi, Ishatu Kol Hagoim Tamid. All right, now watch what this says so you understand it. Kika Ashar Shutetem. All right, because you have drank on, see, because you have drank, the drink there is a masculine plural. So that tells me specifically, this is only men drinking at this particular moment, Al Ha Kodeshi, upon my holy mountain. And by the way, if you look at Obadiah, it's Mount Zion. It's in verse 17, see? But, but on Mount Zion, there will be those who escape. All right, but let, let me continue though. Al Ha Kodeshi 
see, and the nations shall continually drink, and that is gender inclusive, both men and women. What was the Pope of Rome doing? He was showing that he was Jesus Christ, and his disciples were having a communion with him in the upper room, declaring himself to be God on this earth. Now, I know there are some of you who don't like it when I yell, my gosh, friends, I'm trying to wake somebody up. I'm trying to get somebody to open their eyes to see what is happening. You got prophecy fulfilling all around you and people don't realize it? He effectively turned Mount Zion into the Mount of Esau. See, how do I know that? Because Obadiah also calls him calls the Roman Catholic Church, he calls them Esau. That was, oh my gosh, friends. All right, let, let's look at it just so you'll know this, so you can see it. Obadiah 1.6, how are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? This is what indicts him. Obadiah basically is indicting the Roman Catholic Church, as be, or the Romans, I should say, as being Esau. The Roman Catholic Church only takes the place of uh, Constantine's, uh, well, he's the one that made it into a church. And okay, Constantine was the descendants of the Roman Titus general. In other words, not descendant of a birthright, but in other words, as far as bringing about what they did. What does this say? For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. All right, so Esau's violence against Jacob. It wasn't ever in this life, friends. Esau and Jacob actually reconciled their differences. Right? Verse 11, In that day thou, that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou was as one of them. All right, who were the strangers? It was the Syrians. Why the Syrians? The Syrians were part of the invasion that Titus used them, because why? The, the Romans had already conquered Syria. So he, he employed them to come down to Jerusalem and use their military strength to do the, do the dirty work on Israel. All right? But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that the, he became a stranger. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Now Obadiah is identifying prophetically, because Obadiah writes this before it ever happens. But he identifies prophetically that it's the children of Judah or the house of Judah. All right. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of their distress. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Who? Esau. Okay. What substance? Well, it's right there on the Ark of Titus, not far from the Vatican. See, you have the menorah, you have, uh, uh, you have some of the horns that they were, the temple horns, etc. Nor have laid hands on the substance in the day of their calamity. So Esau are the Romans. And the Romans are again in Israel so they can have an official seat in the upper room. So therefore, the Romans are the descendants of Esau. That's why the Pope sat in the upper room and turned Mount Zion into the Mount of Esau. Now, Revelation 11, 1 to 6. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. That's three and a half years, friends. Three and a half years. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, the two candlesticks before the God of the earth, which is in Zechariah. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies, and any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Isn't that what Elijah did when, when uh, they came up there with the army of 50 and he called fire down from heaven and devoured them? See, these have power to shut heaven and it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Isn't that what Elijah did? Close the heaven for three and a half years and have power over the waters to turn them to blood. Isn't that what Moses did? Isn't that Moses' home ministry? And to smite the earth with plagues as often as they will. 
Isn't that what Moses and Aaron did? Smited the earth with plagues? Isn't that what it states in Exodus 32 that I read to you a few moments ago? God says Moses would come again. He spoke about the plagues. All right, now, now let's look at this. Revelation 13, 13. I want you to be aware of something here. It's really important. Because Satan also has the power about this fire. Remember, he's going to have two false witnesses. The Antichrist will have two false witnesses. Why? They consulted about God's hidden ones. In other words, they know they got to come up with some guys that can do some miracles, just like James and Jambres withstood Moses so will these of reprobate mind do the same thing. And he doeth great wonder, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwelleth on the earth by the means of those miracles. What you're seeing with this ecumenical movement, friends, is only the beginning. The deception is coming. And many people are going to fall for it. They're already falling for it. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. Revelation 18.4 Unfortunately, I'm afraid that doesn't just apply to the Vatican in Rome, but I am afraid that they're going to build a third temple in Jerusalem as a temple of one, like what they're doing in Berlin, and this is going to be what God is calling about, Come out of her, my people. And he's going to send the two witnesses to try to call them out before they receive the plagues. And the two witnesses bring the plagues, so they better get to Goshen while there's time. <sighs> Numbers 34, 30. Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses, plural, but one witness shall not one witness shall not testify against any person to cause him to die. You know, I put that in there for a reason because you know the Bible also says, and I meant to put this in, but I forgot to. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity, and he that killeth by the sword shall be himself killed by the sword. Now I know that can have different types of prophetic overtones and meanings. Meanings. It's not just limited to one or the other. But I do think it's interesting in light of the fact that the sword has always represented the Word of God. The Word is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing asunder even the, the bone and the marrow and the thoughts and intents of the heart. Is that not right? So my question question is here is that in this case here see they use the sword the church uses the sword to kill people by because they lead them astray and they add to and they take from it hmm. remember the scripture how that says that you cannot put to death even like in the case of a prostitute without there being two witnesses least two, two or three. Why do you think God sends two witnesses to the earth? Because see, God is the one that's going to do the stoning. He's going to be the one that does the burning. Nobody on this earth is going to be doing it. It'll be God himself. I wondered, just wondered, if we see in the scripture the hailstones about the weight of a talent, a hundred pound stones that will fall out of the heavens, fire, could that be some supernatural, uh, miraculous event in the heavens that God does himself? Or is this the planet X coming by after the witnesses, the, two minute, the ministry of the two witnesses is completed, and then planet X comes rolling by with its stones dropping on the earth inside from its tail? I don't know. That's only hypothetical. I can't say the answer on that. Friends, one thing, though, that I do want to bring back to your attention let me just bring it right back to you again. This blew me away, this thing in Obadiah. And Savior shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. That's your two witnesses. Saviors, or deliverers, plural, shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. What, there's, what he's saying is that the Pope of Rome has made Mount Zion into his own mountain. That means it's time for the two witnesses to come on the scene. As the old saying goes, it's later than you think. I'm Stephen Benoon. You've been watching Israeli News Live, a prophetic segment of our broadcast. Thank you for those of you that have been 
helping us financially to make this trip to Israel. That's about to transpire in the coming hours. Thank you for that. Thank you for your help. And if you would like to continue, if you'd like to also support that, we didn't quite make our goal. So, but we wanted to thank those of you that have given. It's you've been a tremendous blessing, so that this trip can uh, come come together. So, if you want to be a part of it as well, IsraeliNewsLive.org or IsraelReturns.com. Thank you. God bless you.